turned on the lights, I cranked up the fan and started on that.
week we were supposed to read chapter 14, of the, that's to say, two, a week ago, we were supposed to read chapter 14, a miserable chapter, just full of nasty, ugly stuff. I didn't feel led to preach on that, so I read on chapter 15, and I tried to write a sermon last week on chapter 15, and nothing came. I mean, literally nothing came. And so this week I went back to chapter 15, and immediately a message came, which always indicates that for some reason I was ahead of where I should have been. So we're going to talk about chapter 15 today. And chapter 15 introduces a major, major person in the Bible. If we were to take the time to study the Old Testament and specifically Judaism, we would find that all of Judaism rests on two ideas or two facets. One is the law. The law being... Uh, the foundational part of it is the Ten Commandments and then all of the other things that Moses were given by God. So we have the law that tells us what to do. And the law is represented by Moses. And we've already talked briefly about Moses. The other pillar of, the, of Judaism is a clump of people known as the prophets. And the greatest prophet of those was a man called Elijah. And we're going to take a peek at the beginning of Elijah's life today. I have not looked yet at chapter 16, so I would, I would assume that we're going to continue to talk about Elijah next week. Elijah is the single greatest prophet of Judaism and possibly the greatest prophet to ever come before humankind. We're going to begin by looking at 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, we need to know that Ahab is the king, by the way, As the Lord our God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain for these years, except by my word. The word of the Lord then came to him, saying, Go away from here, and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Sherith, which is east of the Jordan. Now this is the very first time that we have seen the word or the name Elijah show up in our journey through the story. And to set up where we need to go, we need to get out of democratic America and go to a world where king was the ultimate word. He was the guy, the man. And he, you didn't go to the king unless you were summoned. You never walked into the king's presence without being escorted. And you never spoke first. And if anybody violated those rules, there were gentlemen along the walls with swords and spears who would go, well, make that mistake twice. We don't have any indication that Elijah was summoned to the court. We don't have any indication that Elijah was given permission to speak. We have every indication that Elijah walked up to the king who could have put him to death in a heartbeat and he said, I've got some news for you. It's not going to rain and there'll be no dew until I come back. See you later. <laughs> what? We, we cannot grasp the significance of that. We cannot grasp how how the nerve, for lack of a better word, the nerve that it took. Can you imagine? Just go with it. Well, I don't care how you feel about the Donald. Just pretend for the moment like you want to go to the White House and you want to tell the Donald something. You know who I'm talking about, right? And so you decide, I'm going to go to the White House and I'm going to tell Dr. President Trump what I have to say to him. And so you get on your, get in your car and you drive there and you come out to the gate and you pay no attention to the guard and you walk right past, that's not going to happen. But you try to, and you get by, and you go inside, and somehow you find your way through all those rooms, and you find your way to the, and you walk right in and you say to him, you are one miserable human being, and God's going to punish you, and I'll be back in a few years and tell you more. Can you imagine doing that? Could you imagine <clears throat> telling your boss something that was going to make him or her really, really angry. Now, Jamie, I want you to know you are a miserable, miserable manager. You are a ridiculously poor dentist. And you have no business even. Can you imagine doing anything like that? 
let alone to somebody who can put you to death in a heartbeat. Could you imagine even telling your boyfriend or girlfriend or your spouse something that's going to make them very angry? Elijah walks into the presence of the king uninvited, unannounced, and he says, there's going to be no rain and no dew till I show up again. Don't you think, I, if you were king, would you not have, seize him, we'll keep him here and it'll rain. Think of the level of confidence that Elijah must have had in what he was told to do and who he was called by to do it. It took a great deal of nerve to go into the king. And so he says what he has to say, and then he goes off on a God-appointed camping trip for almost three years. Three years. No rain, no dew. Meanwhile, back at the King Ahab ranch, things are not going well. That's a text. <laughs> um, People are looking to the king to solve the problem. Hang on for 10 seconds. All right. Somebody was taken to the ER right before the church started this morning, and that was telling me what, what happened. Um, so everybody looks at the king and expects the king to solve the problem. They say, hey, king, in case you haven't noticed, we didn't do so good in the fields last year. We need some rain, you know. So you've got priests over here, you've got, you got guys over here, but that's what their job is. Would you arrange for them to make it rain? And the second year goes by, and it's no rain, no, no pasture. Things are not going well. Third year goes by, and King is not a happy guy. All right? You have supreme authority and the supreme power, and you know who's caused this problem, right? And you know if you can get him back here, you can fix the problem, but you can't find him. And every month you can't find him, you get angrier and angrier. And you plot what you're going to do, and you, you know, and one day he comes walking into the room. You'd think that King Ahab would have been happy to see him. Wouldn't you? Finally, God appears to Elijah and he says, go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain to the land. 1 Kings 18, 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? The king, okay? Now get Elijah's answer. I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of Jehovah and have followed the Baals. Baal is not a god not somebody like Zeus or he is, that is a generic term meaning idols, meaning somebody other than God. So King Ahab and his father are so immoral that God had to send judgment. And, and Elijah doesn't come in groveling, begging for his life. He doesn't come in saying how sorry he is that things have gone this way and he wished it wasn't him and it really wasn't him. He doesn't do any of those things. He walks in and he says, you want to know why it hasn't rained for three years? It's your fault and your behavior and your dad's behavior. You're all my stars. I mean, it's a wonder there weren't eight swords pierced through his heart in an, in an instant. We cannot even imagine the nerve that that took. We would call that throwing gasoline on the fire. And then... Then we have this wonderful passage of scripture, and you probably did not realize this, but the passage I'm about to read is a description of the first reality TV show. It's called Survivor Prophets Edition. And if you look at the, in the margin of your Bible, I think you'll find that note. It says Survivor Prophets Edition. I'm kidding. But the point is the same. Elijah says to Ahab, all right, <laughs> You've been following these, the advice of these 450 guys who say that they have, they've got the God's ear. All right? And so let's find out if they have the God's ear or not. Let's have a little challenge. And I propose that you bring your guys, and I'll bring just me, and we'll have a little fire challenge. And the, and the priests of Ahab cannot refuse 
when they will lose face with the king and lose their jobs. So here's the whole story. It'll take me a minute to read it, but I'd like you to follow along. <clears throat> so Ahab sent a message among the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and he said, How long will you hesitate between, between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. The people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left of the prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen, and let them choose one oxen for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. <clears throat> then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of Jehovah. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, yeah, 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 that's a great idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one ox for yourself, and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. And then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning to noon, and saying, Oh, Baal, answer us! But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped around the altar which they made. It came about noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Well, call with a loud voice, for he is a god. He's either occupied or gone aside or he's off on a journey. Maybe he's asleep and needs to be wakened. So they cried with a loud voice, and they cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. When midday was passed, they raved until the time of the evening offering, sacrifice, offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And so all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Jehovah, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and he cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers, we're talking about four foot high, and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and he said, O Jehovah, God of Abraham, Israel, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and I have done all of these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you, Jehovah, are God and that you have turned their hearts back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And all the people saw it. They fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is Jehovah. The Lord, He is God. And then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. And so they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kaisha, Kishon, and they slew them there. Wow! That is possibly, possibly, the single greatest demonstration of God's power in the entire Bible other than creation itself. As I was reading that and praying over that this morning, I thought to myself, what would happen if that happened today? What, what would the world's response be if in downtown Rushville, on the courthouse front lawn, a pastor, I'm not saying me, 
but a pastor put out an offering, covered it with wood, had a big sign behind it, and said, be here at 6 o'clock on Saturday night and watch lightning strike this pile of wood. And when it does, you realize God is who He says He is. As people drive by the courthouse all week long and they see that sign, how many people would come back on Saturday at 6 o'clock? How many people would gather around the courthouse just to see, you know, just for giggles? And then if they were there, and lightning strikes that pile of wood precisely at 6 o'clock on Saturday night, what would people's reaction be? There would be people taking pictures and videos. They would post it on YouTube and on their Facebook pages. They'd put it on Snapchat and all on Twitter and all over everywhere. And immediately, there would be people all over the country saying, it was a trick. It is a trick. You know, those videos have been digitally enhanced. It didn't really happen like that. There'd be people who were there watching who'd say, well, there was some way that that pastor put some kind of detonating device in there, and then he had an accomplice in the courthouse who triggered it, and then they'd have an explanation. Wouldn't they? They wouldn't take it at face value. No matter what they've seen or experienced with their own eyes, they would find some way to explain away the power and presence of God. Baal's, his demo, uh, uh, Elijah's demonstration showed that Baal was not to be believed or followed, but there was one true God. The question that, that Elijah asks is a question that just racked my soul for two weeks. He turns to the crowd and he says, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If God is God, follow God. If the idols or the bales are correct, then follow the bales. But why do you hesitate? There's been, there are, let's start over again. It's been my experience that there's a great many people who come to church. There are a great many people in America who say, well, I have not yet decided on God, and I certainly haven't decided on the devil. I'm right here. What does Elijah say? Elijah says, you either are or you aren't. You either believe in God or you believe in the devil. You are either one of God's children or you aren't. There is no middle ground. There is no safe place that you can be, that I can be, until we make up our minds. Because if we have not made up our minds to follow Jesus Christ, we have made up our minds to follow Satan. That is an extremely difficult thing to preach. It is an extremely difficult thing to hear. It's an even harder thing to believe. Somehow, as good and nice and sweet a person as I am, I'm going to hell because I have not yet accepted Jesus Christ. Elijah says, how long will we waver? How long will you waver between Baal and God? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. All right, I'm going to go deep now. And I'm not even sure I'm saying it correctly. Has anybody ever heard of the principle of Buridan's ass? B-U-R-I-D-A-N-S. Buridan's ass. It's a principle of philosophy. Anybody ever heard of that before? Okay, I never had either. The principle of Buridan's ass is this. It is a paradox of free will. It represents a hypothetical situation. I didn't give you a picture of that, did I? It represents a hypothetical situation wherein a donkey is equally hungry and equally thirsty and is placed exactly between a stack of hay and a pail of fresh water. And the paradox assumes that the ass will always go to whichever one is closer, except they're all, they're both exactly the same distance apart. And according to the philosophy, the donkey will starve to death and die of, of lack of water because he cannot make a rational decision whether to go for the hay or the water because they are both equal distances away from him. Now, how does that fit into what I'm trying to teach? Unable to choose between the two piles, the donkey dies. A great many people think that they can stand between Satan and God 
and not choose, but they've already chosen. And to think that you can stay in that area is to die. How long will we hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is Jehovah, follow him. If Baal is Jehovah, follow him. I read a story this week of a very rich man who made a lot of money in real estate in New York, and no, I'm not talking about President Trump. And this gentleman um, uh, loved New York, and he decided to buy a plot in a cemetery in New York, and uh, he told his family that that's where he wanted to be buried. Well, the years went by, and he, like many of us, decided that living in a northern climate with old bones and old joints is not a fun thing to do, so we moved to Florida. And he bought a big, beautiful home in Florida, and he lived there for many years. And finally, he bought a cemetery plot in a really nice, beautiful cemetery in Florida. And as he was on his deathbed, finally, he was approaching death, and the family wanted to know whether he wanted to be buried in Florida or in New York. So they sent his favorite granddaughter to him, see him on his deathbed, and she said, Grandpa, do you want to be buried in New York or in Florida? And he roused himself up and he whispered and he said, surprise me. You and I don't want to come to the end of life and say to God, surprise me. Because if we haven't chosen the one way, we're going to end up the other way. How long will we waver? If God is God, believe in God. If Baal is Baal, believe in Baal. I am a, a guy who likes to make decisions. I just am. I, just, I like to solve problems. I like to make decisions. And great and blessedly, the Lord has chosen to put me with someone who isn't that particularly happy about making decisions. She will, but if left alone, she won't. She'll prefer that I make it, which is great. And but we'll come to a situation like we go to a restaurant, you know, and she'll get out of the car and there'll be a jacket in the car or she'll take her sweater. She said, should I take the sweater into the restaurant? You think I'll be cold or should I leave the sweater in the car? Right? Common, common question, right, ladies? And I hear, I say, which will cause the greatest pain? Which will cause the greatest discomfort? Will it be more discomforting to drag the sweater along and have to keep track of it and not wear it and keep it on the chair and not keep it on the following on the floor? Or is it more discomforting to go and be freezing the whole time you're trying to eat your meal? I think that's a great principle for making decisions. I think it's a great principle for theology. For the question of believing or not believing in Jesus Christ, stepping out in faith or not stepping out in belief, which will cause the greatest discomfort? And I would make the I would stand on the premise that the best life you can possibly have is one where you know who created you, you know why you're here, you know what you're supposed to do, and you know where you're going. You'll get the greatest sense of satisfaction out of life if you have those answers. I, I assure you, nothing will scare you or disrupt you very much if you know where you're going and you know what you're called to be. But if there's a great deal of discomfort in not knowing where you're going or what you're doing or what's going to happen. What's the most painful outcome of not making a decision? How long will you hesitate or waver between two opinions? If God is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. There's a painting that I want to show you. See if you can notice what's odd about this painting. I know it's not very big. It's the best I could do. This is painted by Holman's Hunt. It's called The Light of the World. And Christ is shown in the garden at midnight, holding a lantern in his left hand and with his right hand. He's knocking on a heavenly panel door. When the painting was unveiled, the critic remarked the painting was not finished. There's no handle on the outside of the door. You know why? Because the door represents the door to your heart. And although Jesus can knock, there's only one way the door gets open. From your side. How long will we waver? If God is God, believe in God. If Baal is real, believe in Baal. 
Today we have an opportunity to choose. The hardest part about making a decision is making the decision. The hardest part is making the decision. You put out the picture of the train. I have a closing illustration that really touched my heart. Literally, the tears made the paper in front of me wet when I did this, when I read this. This, this is actually a true story. It took place in western Kansas in the late 1800s. <clears throat> there was a train that regularly ran through a remote part of western Kansas where there weren't many houses. <clears throat> there was a family that had homesteaded on that particular area near the train. And this family who had homesteaded on that farm near the train had a daughter. She was about six or seven years of age. I can't remember exactly. And she got the greatest kick out of coming out of the house. She could hear that train coming a long ways. She'd come running out of the house, and she'd stand alongside of the tracks and wait until she saw the engineer and the co-engineer, and she'd stand there and wait. And the engineer and the co-engineer, they had a long, boring ride across western Kansas. Trust me, it is a long, boring ride across western Kansas. And they would look forward every day to seeing this little girl and waving to her as they went by. They did this day after day, week after week, month after month. <clears throat> when she was about eight years old, they were late getting the water loaded onto the steam engine in eastern Kansas, so they were late getting to western Kansas. By the time they got there, it had fallen dark. And then they were, trying, they were going full steam, trying to make up time, and suddenly the engineer caught at the end of his headlight this little girl standing on the tracks, peering down the tracks. And he tooted the horn at her, sure that that would get her to jump off the tracks, and she didn't jump off. And he realized that the speed they were going, no matter what they did, they were a loaded train, no matter what they did, they were going to run over her if she didn't get off the tracks. And he was terrified to let it go in hopes that she would jump off there. So he got out on the front of the cow catcher. See that thing out front? He got out on the front of that and braced himself on the front rails as the train hit the brakes, as the co-engineer tried desperately to stop the train. He's standing out there on the front of that, reaching out. He grabs this little girl by her hair a fraction of a second before her dress is caught on the front of that train. He grabs her up, leans back into the railings, and hangs on. And they finally get the train stopped. And her parents come running across the field. And the co-engineer gets out and goes running to the front. And they, they, the girl was perfectly fine. The engineer died of a heart attack. She was safe in his arms, and he died saving her. What's the point of the story? Put your name in place of little girl. Put Jesus Christ in place of engineer. How long will we wait? Today is Communion Sunday. I'm going to ask that you go to the tables today as you feel led. And I'm going to do something. We're going to do two things different today. First of all, Pam is going to be able to serve communion today. The deacons have decided that that's okay. So if you want to go, and deacons and Pam, if you would go to the tables now, I'd appreciate it. But I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask everybody to go to a table today. And I'm going to ask if you would look at, answer two questions when you get to the table. You don't have to take communion if you don't want to. That's no big deal. I want every single person to go to one of the six tables and answer these two questions. What is the thing I am most thankful to God for this morning? And what is the one thing I would most like God to do for me this morning? As you feel that, it will take some time. I know it will. I beg you to sit quietly. Let the music play. Let your souls be open. And let's just be together with the Lord as you feel that. Holy Father, I ask your blessings upon what is about to un un happen, unfold, what's about to happen. And I pray that those who are gathered in this room would make a decision. For to waver is to decide against you. I know that you are 
on the front cow catcher of life, as it were, you are reaching frantically before we are destroyed one way or another. Help those who have never decided to make the decision this day. We ask these things in your holy and blessed name. Amen.